Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks uh, for being here. Um, let me uh, start today by thanking uh, Sheriff Lutz and the, uh, the de deputies that uh, were in the middle of this uh, very, very difficult uh, event. You know, um, when you think about what he was able to do and his deputies to protect the public from what could have been a disaster, and, and let's remember that no one was killed and there were no injuries. I had a chance to talk to Sheriff Lutz and, uh, and one of his deputies, and at some point uh, they have them come down here so I can personally thank them for the efforts that they did. The animals they were dealing with were obviously very beautiful, but also very powerful. And uh, I'm to some degree acquainted because I've spent a significant period of time with my wife uh, out in the woods and and we've encountered grizzly bears, and uh, we have seen uh, the big moose, and I, we've even been hiking out in, Mon in Canada where we've seen the mountain lion. These are unbelievable animals, beautiful, strong, and very potentially very dangerous. I'd also uh, like to thank Jack Hanna. He was, uh, of course, Johnny on the spot, and I'm thrilled that, uh, that Susie uh, is here today. Uh, uh, Jack is a terrific guy. I've had a long relationship with him, and uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, I like Jack, but I love Susie. Susie, thanks for being here today. Uh, let me just tell all of you that governors can't just invent laws. There have been questions about an old executive order and rules that surround it. I really wish that I could have the power to just enact any law I want. But we have a system of government that doesn't do that. You must seek statutory authority or lawmaking authority through the legislature. So when we took a look at the executive order, it was pointed out to me by um, David Mustine and the leadership at the Department of Natural Resources that, frankly, they didn't have any authority to carry things out. And as a result, that is why we appointed a task force to take a look at what is uh, actually a very complicated issue. And they have been working on that issue with stakeholders um, uh, that represent uh, various of the uh, various interested parties. Um, what we had really wasn't real, because if it's not anchored in the law, it has no force, it has no teeth. And that is why we then move forward to create a task force. But you know, I have to also tell you that I think many of you know I'm a pretty impatient person. And when you see the kind of uh, tragedy that happened in Muskingum County, you, you just can't look away from it. it you know, uh, it just was an unbelievable situation. As somebody said, we lost 1% of, of the Bengal uh, population. And, you know, these are God's creatures, and it's difficult. And so I asked the staff to get together across our cabinet and figure out what we could do in the short run what authority was currently on the books, and what kind of innovative and imaginative uh, thinking could be brought to bear to help to deal with this problem in the short run. And I'm very pleased to tell you today that, um, that we have some things that we believe we can do, or we have authority, or agencies or entities have had authority that frankly haven't been used. One of the things that has amazed me uh, since I have been governor are how many things have been left undone. As you all know, we had a big battle with nursing homes to allow mom and dad to stay in their own home. This was going on for 25 or 30 years. We finally got it done. I was aghast that this battle hadn't been won earlier. Same is true with sentencing reform, where people just looked the other way, where we created uh, big, big mistakes inside of our legal system. And when I uh, took office and started the battle against prescription drugs, I, what were people doing? It's not like this just happened yesterday. Uh, now we've expanded the battle on prescription drugs, which we'll have more to say about, to the battle against all drug trafficking and drug abuse inside of our state and the people that come in and take advantage of us. We're trying to take on every challenge. Uh, it's not always easy to do it. Frankly, that's why a lot of people haven't done it in the past. It was just easier to look the other way. But fortunately today I'm able to sign an executive order uh, that will have teeth that is founded in the law and gives power to people. And some of the folks uh, that are here uh, have been very, very cooperative. And let me run through what we are directing. 
Number one, we are directing the Departments of Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Health to work with local health officials, humane societies, and law enforcement to identify locations where dangerous animals might be located, investigate and inspect these locations based on our current statutory authority, and enforce laws that are currently on the books. You're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you, but since 1953, our humane, uh, our humane societies located at the county level had the power, actually the power, to arrest people that were involved with cruelty to animals. Now, I don't know why this power kind of was ignored or was diminished. Uh, and this is not anything having to do with the criticism of the humane societies, but we intend to stand beside them. They already have power in the law to investigate and to bring to the public attention these kinds of problems that exist out there. I read the other day that there were complaints against this gentleman since 2004, and yet uh, it continued. Uh, we also believe that our Ohio Department of Health, working with local health officials, can also identify dangerous places that threat to public safety. And if you have a guy that's got lions inside of a, inside of a compound that can jump out of the wire and you know, break into your house, that's an issue of public safety. So we are going to stand beside them, our Department of Agriculture, Department of Health, and Natural Resources to again identify the locations where these dangerous animals may be located. We frankly don't know where they all are. We don't know, but we intend to find out. And we will investigate and inspect those locations based on the authority that we have and enforce laws that are currently on the books that frankly have not been used. Number two, we direct agencies to work with the zoos to safely house animals that are captured or confiscated. The zoos are critical on this, and we have with us, uh, we have with us some folks from the zoo who will have an opportunity to, uh, to speak. Uh, I'm thrilled that uh, Dale, who's the CEO of the Columbus Zoo, is here. Uh, Tom, uh, the CEO of the Columbus Zoo, and we have other zoo officials here as well. Why is it important? You know, maybe one of the problems in the past is if somebody saw these animals being kept in a situation where they didn't feel good about it, they didn't know where they would put the animals. Where would they go? So it has been absolutely essential to involve the zoos in this to say, can you assist us when it comes to prioritizing those situations that we consider to be uh, particularly dangerous? And. Um, you know, I had a, just an opportunity not long ago to visit the wild, which is 10,000 acres. So it's not just the Columbus Zoo, but other opportunities like that, uh, that can be in a, a, a situation to be able to house uh, these particularly uh, dangerous, captured, and confiscated animals. We direct the Ohio Department of Natural Resources to set up a hotline for complaints and inquiries. We want a place where people can go and they see something that they don't like, a lot of times they don't know who to call. So what a terrific opportunity it would be to have an opportunity for people to go direct to the Department of Natural Resources and register their concerns. We also are directing the Department of Natural Resources to re-inspect permit holders for potentially dangerous native species. Now, they get issued permits. We're still trying to find out the last time this guy was issued a permit, I think, um, uh, what year was it, Two, 2000 and, uh, 2007, I, I don't know when they were, were ever out there inspecting him, don't know what the story was, but we want them to go out and inspect those animal holders who have native animals, but let me tell you, we do not have the authority at the current time to track down exotic and, uh, and dangerous animals that are not native to Ohio. These people, in some ways, are, are not affected by the law. I'm told that this guy was not affected even by federal law. The Department of Agriculture, U.S. Department of Agriculture, said that this was a sanctuary. They had no authority. We will be looking at what authority we can bring in to clearly put ourselves in a position uh, of determining whether anybody out there is qualified and whether they have the ability to even hold these animals, and frankly, we got to think about what animals they ought to have, but that is, for, that is for later. But it is interesting that we do not have the authority to go in on something other than native species. 
We also are directing the Ohio Department of Agriculture to work with the U.S. Department of Agriculture to identify unlicensed auctions of dangerous animals and take appropriate action. This is one of the things that I know Jack Hanna feels very strongly about. We have one gentleman in Ohio that we know of. He has not, he has not auctioned off any dangerous or exotic animals, as I understand it, or exotic, dangerous animals, for the period of the last, last two or three years. He has agreed to restrain for 90 days all auctions while we take a look at what we want to do in, in this regard. Um, and clearly, people who are holding illegal auctions, uh, we're going to go after. Now, I think the possibility exists as we work through the broader framework of what we are going to do to change the statute. The opportunity exists to, um, to perhaps ban all of these auctions for what we would, what we would describe as, uh, as, as dangerous animals. 